Do you want me to start over? Matthew chapter 3. Rick's actually trying one of the uh, headsets out in the foyer. And he just looked at me and pointed to his ear. So I, I would have kept on going had I not seen Rick. So appreciate that heads up. All right. Matthew chapter 3 is where we'll be in just a moment. Story told of a um, car theft, robbery or burglary into a vehicle and then the stealing of that car. In 1981, I believe, in the state of California, Volkswagen Beetle, a bug, was stolen. And within a few hours after it was stolen, the police went to greater lengths to try to recover that vehicle. Put out all points bulletins to all the various agencies that might be remotely near where the car originated. They set up roadblocks trying to find this Volkswagen, not this one, but a Volkswagen Beetle that was stolen. The reason they went to greater lengths than usual to recover a stolen vehicle was in taking statements from the owner. The owner said there was a box of crackers in the front seat that were laced with rat poison. He was headed home to go set those out to get rid of a mice problem that he had. And so upon finding out that they were in the vehicle that was now stolen, there was a sense of urgency to try to protect the life of this suspect who had stolen the car. Interesting kind of thinking there, isn't it? That they're now trying to chase after and catch the guy. But not only to prosecute him, not only to, to, to catch him because he had broken a law, but now they were trying to, quote, catch him because they needed to save him from possible sickness and death were he to ingest those crackers. I don't know if that's true or not. It's purported to be true, but it's a fascinating way of thinking, especially as it relates to God's desire for us. When it comes to the concept of repentance... When we think about why God reaches out to us and why God has sent us his son. Remember Jesus would say in that conversation to Nicodemus, John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Yes, for those who fail to repent, there will be condemnation. But the whole point, the whole purpose of God has been to send Jesus to, quote, catch us, to correct us for the purpose of saving us and rescuing us. Much is the same when it comes to this concept and this command of God that we call repentance. The command to repent. If we're reading our daily Bible reading this past week, we began once again the New Testament. And the first command, the first imperative verb in Matthew is not chapter 3, verse 2, but the first command given from a messenger of God to a group of people who would desire to be or possibly be God's people, this is the first command. You've got some commands from... Um, Herod, in chapter 2, you got some commands from angels to, jo uh, to Jesus' parents. But now you get into chapter 3 and you have John's preaching, and the first command is repent, change. And our association with that word is, is sometimes, I'm afraid, at least for me, if you're like me in this, just d predominantly negative. Why do we have to repent? That's hard. That hurts. That kind of thinking. But why does he command us to repent? And so while John's preaching is not directly to us because it's pre-kingdom, and we'll talk about that a little bit, the tenor of what he commands is still very important for us today as we consider the need for not only initial repentance when we come to obey Christ, but also continuing to live a life of constant repentance. We know we need it. Romans 3.23 reminds us we all have sinned and we all continually fall short of the glory of God. What do we do as forgiven children of God who sin once again? We desire forgiveness 
We desire that cleansing. Do we remember and recognize and commit to continuing to repent and growing and changing from that sin? If we're not careful, we might find ourselves falling back on those, those tired lines. Well, that's just how I've always been. I've always struggled with that. That's just who I am. Granted, we're going to each breathe our final breaths in this life still with some struggles, still with some things that we're working to overcome. We're never going to get to the end of this life and say, well, I made it. There's no more struggle. But neither should we ever be comfortable with allowing sin to remain or be repeated in our lives. And so we're challenged and confronted with this command, repent, change, improve. Listen to what John would do when he preaches it. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Here's the preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. What's he mean by that? The kingdom is now soon to be here. They've waited 400 years since they last heard from an, an official messenger of God. No inspired prophet has come since Malachi, so they're waiting. And now John the Baptist comes and he says, repent, because the kingdom is close. It's coming near. You think about going to, to a significant uh, sporting event. Let's say you, you go to Tuscaloosa or you go to Auburn or, or maybe you go to UAB or something like that and, and you have buddies who are coming in from all over and you get there several hours early, five, six, eight hours early. You're going to maybe tailgate, spend the time on campus before the game. But where are you about two hours before that game starts? Jeremy? It's what? What would you say? You're moving toward the stadium, right? you got the walk of champions. You've got the tiger walk. Everybody starts moving toward the main event. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you've been doing, your direction changes. Everything begins to move in the direction of the main event. John is saying, okay, you've been hanging out for 400 years. Main event's about to come. The kingdom, it's almost here. Change your direction. Start moving in the direction of the kingdom. Well, what's that entail? What do you do to move toward the direction of the kingdom? He says you repent. You change. We'll come back to the significance of all that in just a moment. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, from Isaiah 40, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Matthew is cluing us in on John's identity. He's the one who was in the likeness of Elijah. He's the one who would come before the Lord, who would clear the path for the Lord himself. His teaching of repentance was what paved the way for Jesus to come and then establish his church, his kingdom. Verse 4, John wore the garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism... He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So you see verse 2, the imperative, repent. Verse 3, quoting the imperative from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. Verse 8, the imperative, the command, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He's cutting them off before they can build up some steam. He says, guys, I know you're interested, but I know I'm not sure I really trust your motives. If you're going to come to me, you're going to be baptized by me. You're going to change your life. You mean you got to keep changing how you live. Keep bearing fruit consistent with repentance. It's not just for show. It's not just in case I end up being the one from the Lord. It's authentic change that's seen in how you live bearing fruit. Do not presume to say to yourselves... We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. What do we learn about repentance from John's teaching that can help us in our own repentance? First of all, 
Repentance must be, as always, true repentance is always God-focused. It's about the mission of God. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about God's will being done. That's saturated through his message, obviously, but he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reign of God, the spiritual kingdom is soon to be here. Thus, we must repent. It's interesting, he does quote from Isaiah 40. We re reference that. Uh, depending on which gospel account you're reading, there are various sections or longer or shorter sections from Isaiah quoted. Matthew leaves out verse 4 of Isaiah 40. Listen to how this expands the repentance idea. Every valley shall be lifted up. That's opposite. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. That's opposite. The uneven ground shall become level. Opposite. Rough, plain, rough places into a plain. Opposite. John comes through and says, if you're going to live in the kingdom of God, you cannot keep living the way you've been living. You cannot live for self. You cannot live for how you think you should live. You must get back to living how God has said to live. See, the Jews were living you know, several hundred years after being released back from Babylon. The Persian Empire lets them come. There are some things that changed. They weren't really known for their idolatry. God kind of purged that out of them. But they were known for plenty of other stuff, mingling with the nations around them and, and overemphasizing certain things in the law and mistreating people and all of that. John comes in and says, it's time to change. If you're going to change, if you're going to live in the kingdom of God, you must live like God wants you to live. But also notice this, because he's telling this message to repent, that means that the promise of the kingdom and therefore also this command to repent is not just about God collecting a number of people. It's not just about God sending down a group of people and closing them off in a wall and giving them a territory and letting them be a physical nation. It's about having a spiritual people. And so you know, if you can think in your mind about being a Jew and waiting 400 years, has God given up on us? And we've had these possible, uh, you know, maybe false teachers have come through and claimed to be the Messiah or claimed to be the forerunner. Now we've got this John guy and he's preaching and oh, he's fulfilling these prophecies about Isaiah. Hmm, maybe we should listen to him more closely. But what's he saying? He's saying to repent, to change. We've been waiting on God. Why is he wanting us to do the changing? Because we've been living contrary to what he expects from us. See, if they had been listening to the prophecies, the Old Testament era, the Old Testament itself closes with Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, pointing to John the Baptist, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn. You hear it? Repentance. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. What he's saying is he will turn those who are willing, who have a soft heart, he will turn these Jews who will listen back to being like their father Abraham, their father Moses, their father Elijah. There's going to be a spiritual awakening among the Jews who will listen by way of this messenger, the one from Elijah. They have to get right with God if they're going to be a part of the coming kingdom of God. John makes that clear in his response to the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He cuts them off. He knows where they're, where they're going to go. Well, listen, we are descendants of Abraham. John said if all God was cared about was a, fig, cared about was a physical kingdom, he'd let you die. He'd cut you off. He'd just take all these stones and he can make new descendants of Abraham. You think all God cares about is a physical kingdom? He desires people who will spiritually keep submitting to his will. That's who his kingdom is going to be. And so he says to be prepared, to be ready for the Lord, to be ready for his coming kingdom. Here's what you must do. Change your heart. Change how you live. You have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, who there are, are not really uh, on board with John. They're questioning and challenging John. But you have some who listen closely, some who are impacted for good. In Luke's account, Luke chapter 3, verse 15, as the people were in expectation, they were questioning in their hearts concerning John. 
not doubting, but whether he might actually be the Christ himself. He was effective to some. He was effective to many there. It caused them to think he might be from God. He might be the Messiah himself. His message focused them to God himself. And so repentance is necessary because of God. Thus God commands us. And it's necessary on at least two levels in terms of God's uh, uh, nature. First of all, it's his nature as being so holy. Because he is supremely and perfectly holy, we must repent in order to be more like him. Our sin always stands in gross contrast to his nature. Therefore, repentance is necessary. If I think somehow that I can, can just live how I want to live and tolerate sin and just kind of shrug off sin, I'm mistaken because God's nature is completely devoid of sin. But second, God's just nature, God's just character has made sin known to us and has made the consequences of sin known to us. If you were to rewind all the way back to the garden, before sin had ever entered the world, God said, here's the consequence. No sin. Adam and Eve still in a right relationship with God. In the day that you eat the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. See, that's God's justice. God being clear, here's the line. Here's the boundary. You cross the line, here's what it costs you. You hear that in John's preaching? You don't repent. You don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What happens? You will die. You'll suffer destruction. You'll be chopped down, cut down, thrown into the fire. God's holiness demands we repent, but so too God's expectation, God's clear communication. Here are the boundaries. Here are the consequences. Gives us a path to repentance, but also a clear reason to repent. So, to summarize all of this, God must be at the center of our repentance, and that means that we recognize we're in sin and we're facing away from God, but I turn completely around my orientation, my direction to face, to please, to be with God Himself. He's at the center of all that I do when I repent. But second, notice that repentance does not eliminate pain. This is so crucial. We tend to want to, to do whatever is the quickest path to avoiding or eliminating pain. That's not repentance. Repentance demands change. Repentance demands a certain level of pain. You'll notice back in verse 6 of Matthew 3, they came out to him. They were willing to be baptized by him. They were willing to, to, to follow his commands of repentance. Well, what else does that involve? Them confessing their sins publicly. There was a painful element to their response, a sorrowful element to their response. He challenged the Pharisees and Sadducees. He roughed them up. He pruned them because he knew they needed repentance. But he was still having to crack through because he also knew they didn't know they needed repentance. They needed something painful to prod them into seeing the truth. And when he commands them, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's a constant thing. That's not easy to do. It's not automatic. It's not pain-free. We really get at the heart of this when we look at that familiar text of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul's getting in and, and really starting to get personal with the Corinthians because here uh, they're caught in the middle of these false teachers who are coming through and saying, Paul can't be trusted. He can't be an apostle. Look at how much he suffered. And they've rejected Paul. They've not had their hearts open to Paul and his companions, to Titus. And so Paul commends them for widening their hearts once again, for receiving them. And in the process, he says, it's not just about me. It's about the fact that you changed, that you repented. Notice this, verse 9 of chapter 7, 2 Corinthians. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. You sorrowed, you were hurt into repenting. 
changing. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. They were pained. They were sorrowed. Repentance will begin when we are sorrowed. What At what? Sorrowed at the fact that our sins, our choices have hurt the holiness of God, have gone against the perfect commands of God. That should generate pain and sorrow in us. Where will that lead us? Hopefully to his repentance, to changing as they did. Godly grief leads to repentance, which leads to salvation without regret. Notice the contrast between godly grief and worldly grief. Worldly grief, he says, leads to death. It's most often associated, worldly grief is, with a self-centered focus. The recognition that we don't want to be denied certain things that we, we love, certain experiences, certain relationships, certain benefits. I'm self-centered. I'm focused on the consequences, the denial of certain things in this world. So that's going to lead to constant despair and bitterness. Really kind of feeds the cycle of sin. And a self-centered focus that does not want to miss out on denial or, or is afraid of denying blessings. A loss of those desires. See how opposite that is to true discipleship? True discipleship is the self-denial. It's a denial of self, a complete loss of self. But worldly grief gets upset and sorrowful over the potential loss of earthly blessings or benefits or relationships. Godly sorrow says, doesn't matter what I lose. I'm not going to lose my relationship with God. So seeing God as the center and the focus of repentance should lead us to some sorrow, to some pain over our sin. To echo the thoughts of David in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Knowing good and well, David has sinned against other people too. But his sorrow, his pain was directed at how much he had grieved and hurt God. So godly grief then is both an intellectual awareness that we've broken a law of God but also an emotional weight, an emotional understanding of what it means to break, to go against that very holiness of God. And so that spurs us on to change away from sin and toward His will. And then we don't have a regretful attitude toward God and toward His commandments. We're able to move on because He's forgiven our past. We can move on in the future. We don't look back and say, I wished I would have just given in. I wish I would have just reaped the rewards of that sin. Because say, thanks be to God, he's forgiven me. And this is, this new life is where I need to be and want to be and bearing fruit of what I want to produce. It's interesting, go to Hebrews 12 and verse 17. Esau is held up as an example, kind of opposite of chapter 11 of Hebrews. All those heroes of faith. Well, chapter 12, Esau is an anti-hero of faith. He sought repentance, but he didn't get it. He didn't find it, even though he sought it with tears. He was grieved, but he was not grieved in a godly way such that he corrected and fixed and enjoyed true repentance. So not only does repentance not eliminate pain, it, it demands sorrow. It demands the right kind of sorrow, godly sorrow at what our sin has done to hurt God and his nature. I, I struggle just wrestling with that because am I quick sometimes to just think, well, Father, forgive me of my sins, and we move on. We need to hurt at what our sin does to God so that we will change that sin and change and grow away, of, away from and out of that very sin. We can choose to suffer the pain of discipline, which is involved in repentance, or we can suffer the pain of disappointment. What will happen if we fail to repent, the life that Esau found himself in, or we can suffer the pain of discipline. Repentance demands a difficult life. Demen uh, repentance is going to involve surrender, surrendering to truth and honesty. That's, that's difficult. That's painful at times. Surrender involves, uh, or repentance involves surrendering out of, of being ashamed for the right reasons, broken heart, 
for the right reasons, healthy shame, healthy guilt. Surrender involves a willingness to commit. It's hard. It's painful to look into the future and say, even then I will still commit to this standard. Repentance demands change. Change is rarely easy. But we change our perspective. We change sides. Which side am I on? We change our thinking. We change our actions. Repentance is not the elimination of pain. It's in fact the embracing, the following through, the godly sorrow of repentance. The third, we notice repentance is also something to be celebrated. In Luke's account of John's preaching, Wraps up the paragraph, verse 18, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Isn't that interesting? He comes and he preaches, repent. You have people who come in and try to challenge him and say, we don't need to repent. We're children of Abraham. And yet at the end of it all, Luke says, he kept on preaching good news to the people. See, it's a good message. Yes, it hurts because we... We struggle with sin because we have sinned, because we know all too well what sin is. But oh, it's good news because God says there's a path out. There is a better way. You don't have to end where sin ends, which is death. You remember back in 2 Corinthians 7, what did Paul say in chapter 7, verse 9? He rejoiced at their grieving. Not that their hearts were hurting. He didn't revel in their grieving. But he rejoiced because they had a godly sorrow. That godly sorrow led them to repentance. He celebrated that repentance. It's fascinating this track in Luke into Acts, same author, the connection between repentance and forgiveness of sins. It's mentioned in John's baptism, Luke chapter 3 and verse 3, when Jesus would give his, quote, great commission in Luke's account, Luke chapter 24, he says three things have happened and must happen. It's written from the scriptures. Christ must suffer, must rise the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be preached, proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Connection, repentance, forgiveness of sins. They fulfilled that day, do they not? Acts 2, Pentecost. They cry out, the people do, the Jews do, they're pricked in their hearts. What shall we do with this terrible sin? Peter says, repent. You can have the forgiveness of sins when you are immersed. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 5 and verse 31, God exalted him, Jesus, at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Is there anything greater to celebrate? That the holy God, the one whom we offended with our sin, offers forgiveness and offers change, offers new life through repentance. The forgiveness of eternal consequences. That someone saw that they were in need and they overcame their fears and they turned toward God. No wonder God would celebrate that. No wonder God would turn to his companions and celebrate with them. That's part of Jesus' main point in those three beautiful parables of Luke 15. The shepherd calls his friends and they celebrate. The woman who lost the coin calls her friends. They celebrate. The father calls his servants and they celebrate. Jesus says, you got to choose a side. Do you celebrate when sinners repent or do you look down on them? So when we repent, we need to know God celebrates. Maybe we struggle sometimes to repent fully because we fail to truly celebrate repentance. Celebrate repentance like God celebrates repentance. What gets rewarded gets repeated. So maybe we would do well to come back and not only look at our own repentance, but also look at how we celebrate and how we join in with those who do repent. Even if it's not always in a public way, those who we see making those changes, see overcoming sin, how do we celebrate and walk with and experience joy with them as they grow in the Lord? The more we do that, the more we're like God. Remember, God wants all people everywhere to repent because he wants us to be saved. 
So the command to repentance might sound harsh, and we maybe have this, this image in our minds of that angry you know, kind of street corner preacher screaming, repent. It's a little different when you read the scriptures. God's saying, repent, turn around, because look at what you're missing. Look at the good. Look at the eternal life you're missing out on. Look at the joy of walking with me you're missing out on. Look at the new life made possible. Acts 17, verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. God's not slow. God's not lazy. Peter would say, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, He doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants us to turn to Him and live for Him because He loves us and wants what is best for us. Several years ago, I was in that second floor waiting room at Princeton, or third floor, right? Third floor, cardiac room, cardiac level. Uh, that third floor waiting room uh, with a family from Midway, and there was another family nearby, and, and their loved one was still doing fine. Um, but the surgeon had come back and was just catching up with them, and they kind of just evolved into some small talk about the heart and that kind of thing. And uh, the surgeon got to talking about the heart transplant list. And I don't, I, it doesn't seem like it would fit with HIPAA laws, but, but maybe it is. But he, he name dropped, and I can't remember the name, but I know he said a name of a prominent. Alabama businessman, extremely wealthy. He called him out by name. And he said, you know, he's on the heart transplant list, right? But he can't get one. He said he literally has about all the money in the world, but he can't buy a new heart. Think about that. All the money in the world and you can't buy a new heart. We can't buy a new heart. But God sent Jesus who did purchase us, who did pay the price so that we could have a new heart when we submit to him and say, I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to trust. He gives us the new life, the new heart, made possible through repentance, through change. We get to be that new creature that walks in that newness of life. No matter how far you've gone on the wrong road, Always turn back around. That's a Turkish proverb. One writer says, you cannot change your destination overnight, but you can change your direction overnight. That's what repentance starts with, changing our direction so that eventually our destination will be different. Another author said this, if we put off repentance another day, we have one more day to repent of and one less day to repent in. We put off repentance one more day. We have one more day's worth to repent of and one less day within which to repent. So the command for us, even though we are in the kingdom, even though we now see the beauty and the grandeur of the Lord establishing the church, the command is still repent. Change when we see sin in our lives, when it creeps back in, when it comes out of nowhere, when it's a constant struggle, we still keep turning away from men and back to the Lord to change and repent. Tonight, do you need to become a Christian? If you're not one, you, you can't do that without repentance. It demands change to come to Him. And if you're willing to make that change, and you're also willing to submit to God's commands where He forgives that sin, just like Peter said in Acts 2 that we referenced just a moment ago, He will wash those sins away in the waters of baptism. He'll grant that new life to keep living in a way that bears fruit of repentance. You need to come back to Him. Make a change. Make that change visible and known and public. We can help you and love to help you. You don't have to do it publicly necessarily, but if it's public sin, it's in keeping with principles from James 5 and other places to let the confession, the repentance known publicly too. We'd love to help you make the changes if you need our help. Or the Lord will empower us to do that as well. If we turn our lives over to Him in repentance. If you have those needs, know that we're here. Come as we sing.